If you ask the average person on the street what they know about the Reformation, they might be able to tell you that Martin Luther had something to do with it, and he nailed 95 theses, whatever those are, to a church door. If you ask the average Christian what they know about Luther, they probably would be able to tell you more. But if you ask them about Martin Luther's wife, Katerina, or Katie, to Luther, most would likely respond, well, I know she was once a nun. Yes, I'm out. I think that's disappointing because Katie was a godly, courageous, intelligent, patient, and faithful woman who all but forced Luther to marry her, made him fall deeply in love with her, and managed a large business for the time from their home while he preached, wrote, and taught. Without her faithfulness and patience, who knows if or for how long Luther would have been able to endure the Reformation spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Little is known about Katie's childhood. She was born Katharina von Bora in 1499 into a noble family, but one that had lost all its wealth. At age five, after the death of her mother, Katie's father sent her to a boarding school for her education. Later, at age nine, he placed her in a Cistercian convent in Grima, Germany. In 1515, when Katie was 16, and two years before Martin Luther would nail his 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg, she officially became a nun. While she was in the convent, she learned to read and write in German and in Latin. This also may have been where she learned her management and nursing skills, which would make her indispensable to Luther later, even if he hadn't loved her so dearly. By the 1520s, Luther's Reformation writing was circulating around Germany, and it even made its way into convents and monasteries. In particular, in 1521, Luther wrote Devotus Monasticis on monastic vows, which was a fiery criticism of monastic vows and life. There was a copy of this smuggled into Katie's convent, which may have greatly influenced her. From Luther's teaching, she and others in her order began to see that they could live a holy, godly life outside the convent, and Katie began to be dissatisfied with her life as a nun. Somehow, a group of nuns from Katie's convent got a message out to Luther asking for help. Luther felt obligated to help the many nuns and monks who were convicted by his writing, so he sought a way to help Katie and the other nuns who wanted to escape. Now, you might be wondering why a nun would have to escape from a convent, but in the 16th century, the vows of a nun or a monk were binding for life. To try to discard them was a violation of Roman Catholic canon law and punishable by death. So Katie and the other sisters who were convinced by Luther's writings couldn't just walk out the door. Furthermore, aiding a runaway nun or monk was also a crime punishable by death, But since Luther already had a death sentence on his head and had for many years, one more probably didn't bother him that much. So he arranged for a local merchant to rescue them by smuggling them out in herring barrels, a rather smelly way to travel. And on the day before Easter, April 5th, 1523, Katie and eight, possibly 11 other nuns escaped from Grima. A few days later, the wagon lurched its way into Wittenberg and the ladies were free. But being a freed nun was not a simple life. These were single women in the 16th century, so they didn't really have very many options. At first, Luther tried to see if they could return to their families, but only a few would take them back, since, again, that would bring a death sentence on their families if they were caught. One took a teaching job at the school of Wittenberg, and for the rest, Luther was able to find suitable husbands, which they all wanted. Well, all except for Katie. The first suitors that Luther found for Katie were unsuitable to her. She was apparently a very picky woman, even though she was almost 25, which was considered far beyond marrying age in that time. Luther almost finished the job with an engagement to a man named Hieronymus Baumgartner, but his family didn't approve and quickly had him married to a more appropriate wife. So Luther's search continued. Finally, Katie said she wouldn't marry anyone but Luther himself. 
even though remaining unmarried was practically social suicide for a woman at this time. But that was the kind of woman that Katie was, strong and stubborn. After some resistance from Luther, he finally agreed, and they were married in 1525. Now, it wasn't that Luther was against marriage. Far from it. He was convicted from Scripture that marriage was good and available to all, including ministers. But he believed he should never marry, because I daily expect the death of a heretic, as he put it. He knew that marriage to him was marriage to someone who could be executed at any moment and might even get his wife executed. Furthermore, by this time, Luther was an older bachelor, 41, and Katie was 25, which meant she would be widowed while still relatively young. Yet Katie knew all this was as stubborn and as courageous as Luther, and he finally consented. When he finally agreed, he said that at least his marriage would rile the Pope, make the angels laugh and the devils weep, and would seal my testimony. That sounds very unromantic to us in the 21st century, and indeed it was. Neither Katie nor Luther were under any pretense that they were marrying for love. Marriage for love is a much more recent phenomenon in the history of the world. No matter what movies about pre-modern times try to tell us, very, very few people married for love before about the last 150 years. Marriage was for the stability of families, the bearing of children in a family, the making of alliances, the protection of women, and other more pragmatic reasons like that. However, don't let that make you think that Katie didn't win the heart of Luther. She did. Being committed to her by vows, she also wooed his heart. Over time, their marriage grew into one of mutual respect, love, and admiration. Katie affectionately referred to Luther as Doctor, and his letters to her are sprinkled with playful pet names. Kitty, my rib. Lord Katie. Kette, which is German for chains, an affectionate jibe that sounds like Katie. And Selbander, which is German for better half. Furthermore, it seems that Katie shared Luther's wit and love of sarcasm because his letters were full of it to her. We unfortunately have precious little of what she wrote, Though, in one that does remain, apparently Luther joked about how polygamy was allowed in the Old Testament, to which Katie responded, Well, if it comes to that, I'll leave you and the children and go back to the cloister. So she could give it just as well as Luther could, and anyone watching or hearing their banter in person must have found it quite entertaining. While there is little of Katie's writing, there are many of Luther's letters to her remaining, which testify to their loving relationship, his admiration for Katie, and their witty, joking relationship between them. To my kind, dear master, Lady Catherine von Bora, Mrs. Dr. Luther in Wittenberg, grace and peace in Christ, dear Master Kette, remember this means chains, I do not know what to write to you, since Master Philip and all the others are coming home. I must remain here for the sake of the pious prince. You may wonder how long I must stay here, or how you might free me. I think that Master Franciscus will set me free again, just as I set him free, but not so quickly. Yesterday I had a vile drink, so that I had to sing, If I don't drink well, I am sorry, for I really like to do it. And I thought about what good wine and beer I have at home, and, in addition, a beautiful woman, or should I say, master. Your beloved, Mart Luther D. To the blessed, anxious Lady Catherine Luther, doctor of Zoldorf at Wittenberg, my gracious dear wife, grace and peace in Christ, my most blessed Lady Doctor, we thank you most kindly for your great concern, which has prevented you from sleeping. For since you started worrying about us, a fire at our inn, right outside my chamber door, nearly engulfed us. And yesterday, no doubt through the power of your concern, a stone almost fell on our head and crushed us, as in a mouse trap. For this, we would have had to thank your holy worries, had the dear angels not been guarding us. I fear that if you do not cease worrying, the earth will finally swallow us up. Is this how you learned the catechism and faith? Your willing servant, Martinus Luther.
Yet it wasn't just that Katie had successfully stolen the heart of a grumpy old bachelor like Martin Luther. She was also quite an intelligent and ingenious woman with home and business sense as well as medical and theological knowledge. When they were first married, Luther and Katie were given the black cloister in Wittenberg by the ducal family of Saxony. It was a former Augustinian monastery with about 40 rooms for the couple. Everyone thought that it was merely temporary, even the duke, but Katie wanted to stay. Very quickly, she turned the cloister into a home, a convention center, a student boarding house, an infirmary, and a brewery, much to the delight of Luther. Luther let Katie handle the money, since pretty much all he knew about money was how to spend it, and she acquired herds of cattle and pigs, land for orchards and gardens, chickens, pigeons, and geese, a fishing pond, and about a dozen or so servants. She also again brewed beer that apparently Luther and others thought was the best in the land. At one point, it seems from one of Luther's letters that she threatened to stop brewing beer if he did not come home, which probably worked. She was running a small enterprise from the Black Cloister before long, and Luther called her the Morning Star of Wittenberg because of how early she rose to keep things running. Katie's talents and strength didn't stop there. Luther was obviously under a lot of stress, being the number one enemy of the Roman Catholic Church and a man marked for death. And Katie kept him going with healthy food, good use of herbs to counteract his many stomach problems, and massages to calm him down. She would not let him neglect his health, which many ministers are prone to do, and Luther especially was. At one point early in their marriage, Luther got sick. His normal manner for dealing with illness was locking himself away from everyone else until he recovered, which was probably wise from a germ perspective, though no one at that time knew anything about germs. But when he did that, he didn't eat well or take good care of himself. The first time this happened, Katie told him to come out of the study and eat, which he refused to do, and she then proceeded to break down the door. Apparently, that was the last time he refused her medical advice. Katie was also quite intelligent, and Luther respected and valued her input. No one knows how much Katie may have helped and affected Luther theologically, but his colleagues, like Philip Melanchthon, knew how much he trusted her knowledge and wisdom, and often enlisted her aid in debating with Luther. She was also the only woman who was allowed to join Luther's famous table talk. There were almost always many students and visitors at the Black Cloister, and the custom of Luther, his colleagues, and his students was to have dinner together and then retire upstairs for theological discussion, the table talk. It became famous because his students would write down the talks and then publish them later. Katie was regularly a part of this discussion, the only woman who was, and Luther's colleagues even began to call her Doctorissa. And of course, we cannot forget that Katie was a dedicated mother. She and Luther had six children together, but they also adopted four more and regularly had nieces and nephews in the house. Katie and Luther at some points were raising as many as 16 children in the Black Cloister. So, because of her skills as a mother, businesswoman, and nurse, Luther once quipped to his friends, In domestic affairs, I defer to Katie. Otherwise, I am led by the Holy Ghost. I think by now you can probably see why Luther deeply loved and respected Katie and how critical she was to his life and even the Reformation itself. She was a faithful, patient, and courageous woman, only such a woman could live with Luther, whose godliness and wisdom won the heart of Luther and won the respect of his students and colleagues. They had a happy marriage together for 21 years, Yet one of Luther's fears from the very beginning was how much older he was than Katie and how she would fare after he died. Those fears were realized in 1546, when Katie was only 47. When Luther died, it crushed Katie, for she loved him, as ornery and as grumpy as he was, as much as he loved her. But even upon his death, Luther had one more sign of his love and respect for Katie. He made Katie his heir, which was unheard of for the time. No man ever left his property to his wife, but always to the oldest son. Luther resisting that tradition was one last symbol 
of how much he loved and respected Katie. With the vast enterprise that Katie had created in the Black Cloister, she might have lived well, but for the Skomolka Dick War, which I don't have time to explain right now, but you can go look that up on your own. It started shortly after Luther died, and it forced Katie and the children to flee the Black Cloister. When they were finally able to return a year later, the building itself remained, but the war had ravaged all their land and scattered or killed their livestock. Katie tried to rebuild, but at this point it was not financially realistic. She lived as best she could for six more years, but then the Black Plague forced her to flee Wittenberg again. During flight, she was thrown from her horse and was injured very badly, and she died from those injuries a few months later. The famous philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said of Katie and Luther's marriage that Luther might as well have married a wood plank. His point was that the famous reformer only married Katharina von Bora to prove that he condoned marriage of ministers. She was, in Kierkegaard's view, only one plank in Luther's Reformation platform. I hope by now you can see how incorrect that is. She should never be depreciated in that way. Yet at the same time, overlooking her or forgetting about her completely would be almost just as demeaning. Certainly, she stands in the shadow of her husband who changed not just the church, but the world. But one has to wonder what Luther would have done without her. She was a faithful, patient, devoted, godly, and intelligent woman in her own right, and God used her in ways we can only begin to guess. So, talking about Katie herself took longer than any of the other Christians in this series. But I think it was worth the time. And I wanted to end this series with her because among many virtues, she demonstrates faithfulness and gives us time to talk briefly about it, which I think is a good way to end. We've talked about courage, love, hope, compassion, affliction, faith, and suffering. And if the gospel working in the lives of all these Christians can inspire us to faithfulness to our Savior, like Katie had, then it has been worth every moment of writing and production time. So what does it mean to be faithful or have faithfulness? In Hebrews 11, when the author is talking about faith and showing the faithfulness of many Old Testament believers, he says in verse 13, These all died in faith not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. From the example of these believers and others in Scripture, faithfulness is to persevere in following Christ and using what he has given us for his glory and kingdom, no matter what this life throws at us. We see this in all the faithful of Hebrews 11 and in Katie's life. She persevered under a death sentence with her husband, using her gifts she had for God's glory and his kingdom. Hers may not shine as brightly in history as Luther's, but they were no less important and glorifying to her Savior. And how do we Christians develop faithfulness? Well, as Hebrews says, the faithful of Hebrews 11 didn't receive the things promised but they knew they were coming and trusted God to give them to them in his timing. They trusted God because they had seen God be faithful over and over again to them. So really, our faithfulness is merely the fruit of God's faithfulness to us, which we can see in our lives, yes, but we can see most clearly in the cross. All of God's promises in the Old Testament and the New Testament are fulfilled in Christ. When we look to him and all that he has done for us, we can see clearly how faithful God has been to his people from the very beginning, though we don't deserve his faithfulness at all. Therefore, as Paul says in Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In other words, if God has been faithful to give us Jesus and Jesus was faithful to redeem us, of course he'll be faithful in everything else he has promised. That faithfulness to us gives us the strength 
to persevere in following him and using what he has given us for his glory and his kingdom, no matter what. That's what we see in the believers of Hebrews 11. It's what we see in Katie Luther. You think about that. Amen.